So this afternoon, we have now two hours with the, we'll take a five minute uh, breathing break in between, but uh, we're going to go very deeply into understanding what I can only call reality, okay? So I want to show you this month the the book, You Are the Universe, which is my last book with the quantum physicist, cosmologist. Uh, that was featured on PBS. I don't know if anyone saw that. You saw some of you. And it's going to be showing again there. There might be a 10-part series on that later uh, from Amazon or one of the entertainment companies. So I want to show you a three-minute uh, trailer of that, and then we'll go with our discussion. I'm Dr. Deepak Chopra. In the next 60 minutes, I hope um, we can all together, uh, with a little help and insight uh, from me, uh, help solve the mystery of our existence. So I was traveling through the country, and one of the places that was part of my tour was Los Angeles. I was picked up at the airport by my uh, son, Gotham, and my grandson, Krishan, Krishu as we call him, who was then five years old. He's a very smart little uh, mind, a very smart little fellow. So as we got out of the airport, he looks at me and he says, Dada. Dada is the Indian word for grandfather on the father's side. He said, Dada, what is dark energy? Interesting question to come from a five-year-old. And I said to him, what do you know about dark energy? And he said, it flows through the night sky. Very poetic, very beautiful. I said, what else do you know about it? He said, uh, it's 70% of the universe. I'm thinking to myself, how does he know all this? We get out of the airport and we're driving in the car. We're driving in Santa Monica. I roll down the window and we can smell the ocean. We can see the ocean. He looks at me again. He says, how did they make that? I said, make what? He says, how did they make the ocean? I said, how did who make the ocean? And he said, they. I said, that's not a precise question. You have to tell me what you mean by they. And so I can see him thinking for a bit. And he reframed the question. He said, how did the ocean get made? So I said, the ocean got made the same way as the Earth got made. A giant star exploded and that was the solar system. We're a planet amongst many. The ocean is part of the elements of this planet. And then I kind of turned to him and I said, uh, do you know how many planets there are in the solar system? And he said, well, if you count Pluto, there are nine. But if you don't count Pluto, because some people don't think Pluto is a planet, then there are eight. I said, and where did the solar system come from? He said, the galaxy. I said, where did the galaxy come from? He said, the universe. And I asked him, I said, and where did the universe come from? And without batting an eyelid, he said, from another dimension. So, you know, I'm Indian. I'm thinking, who's this kid? You know, we believe in reincarnation and all that. So I'm thinking to myself, Galileo, Cop Copernicus, maybe even Einstein. I said, Krishu, how do you know all this? He said, it's on my Pokemon.
So that should begin our conversation. <clears throat> if you go on Google or Wikipedia or wherever on the internet and you look at uh, what are the open questions in science. Open means science at the moment has no answer. You know, when you talk to scientists, they say, yeah, we don't know, but at some point we'll know. And uh, there are about 125 open questions in science today. The, the list was first published in uh, Science Magazine in the year 2006. Uh, so we are now in 2017. Uh, in the ensuing 11 years, nothing has changed. <clears throat> we still have the same 150 or so open questions in science. But we want to talk today only about two. The first open question in science is, what is the universe made of? The second open question in science is, what's the biological basis of consciousness? So let's just talk about those two questions today, this afternoon. What's the universe made of? So I'm going to give you the current science and what everybody says. You know, people like Stephen Hawking and Brian Cox and Lawrence Krauss and all the big guys, you know, they win Nobel Prizes and they work at CERN and they do science and good science. You know, and science is based <coughs> on th three, three principles. All science is based on three principles. First, <coughs> scientists come up with a theory. These days, most theories about physical reality are mathematical theories. So mathematics is the basis of all physics. And uh, there's quantum mechanics, which is very mathematical, and there's regular physics, and there's chemistry, biology, all these different disciplines. But most theories of physical reality are based on math. So scientists first come up with theories. They publish them. These days, actually, on the internet, everybody has op open access. Then they see if other people agree with their theories. So theory is the first thing. The second thing is um, observation. And so this observation these days, especially when it comes to the universe, is through big telescopes that are out there in the sky, in space. You've heard of these telescopes, Hubble Telescope, James Watson Telescope, etc. So that's how they look at the big picture. And then they also look at the micro nature of the universe, particles, subatomic particles. <clears throat> and that they do through very sophisticated technology um, at CERN is the biggest place in the world, Switzerland. Next to Geneva, they have something called the Hadron Collider, where they smash particles into smaller particles into smaller particles, again, to discover the nature of reality, both at the big level and at the microscopic level. So theory is first. Observation is second, and observation leads to new experiments that lead to new observations. That's the loop. Theory, observation, experiment, observation. And if everyone kind of agrees on the theories, the experiments, and um, if they can repeat them, they can validate them, then they come to the conclusion that this is how it must be so. Okay, that's the scientific method, and it's very reliable. There's, um, there's um, two things that scientists all understand. A theory must be 
falsifiable, which means you must be able to prove that it's wrong. And um, it, it should be subject to that. And um, um, it should be validated by others. So it's a very good methodology for understanding what we call reality. So with that kind of experimentation, observation right now, uh, scientists have come to the conclusion, where's uh, the clicker? Do you have a clicker? On the other side of the what? Yes. OK. <clears throat> so with that kind of experimentation and theory and validation, can we start making sure this works? the scientists have come to the following conclusions, okay? The first is that 70% of the universe is this mysterious entity that uh, my grandson spoke about, which is called dark energy. So what is dark energy? Dark energy is a, is a mysterious force that is expanding the universe at this moment, where we are, um, faster than the speed of light. So the universe is, <clears throat> think of the universe is like a balloon. And the balloon is inflating. And it's inflating faster than the speed of light, which is supposedly the highest speed you can get, according to Einstein. So according to the same scientists, the universe began with something called a Big Bang, <clears throat> which incidentally was neither big nor did it bang. Okay, But out of nothing, something came into existence. It was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. And then it rapidly expanded. It's called inflation. It tripled in size every billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second till it became the size of a, a football. And then the inflation slowed down. We don't know why, but continued and still is continuing. And the universe from where we are, the cosmic horizon, which is the farthest edge of the universe is 47 billion light years from where we are. <clears throat> 47 billion light years. And what is expanding is the space between galaxies. So just to give you a visual of this, think of the universe as like a big balloon. <clears throat> and think of all the galaxies as the if you think of the Earth like a big balloon, then you think of all the continents uh, as the galaxies. And then think of all the nations and the continents as the stars. And then think of all the stars having planets around them um, as the states, etc., cities. I'm just giving you a metaphor. But what is expanding is the space between galaxies. The space between galaxies is expanding faster than the speed of light. And it's a mathematical number that Einstein described. It's called the cosmological constant. So this constant, this mathematical number remains the same. But as the distance between galaxies expands because of the space expanding, then the expansion accelerates. Anyway, that's a technicality. But what is this dark energy? <clears throat> no one knows. Okay, The best they can say is it's the opposite of gravity. So gravity brings things together. This rips things apart. And what it's ripping apart is space. That's 70% of the universe. <clears throat> so that leaves... 30% of the universe remaining. 
of which 26% is another mysterious entity called dark matter. And the reason it's called dark matter is it's invisible. You can't see it. And the reason you can't see it is that it doesn't interact with light. And the reason it doesn't interact with light is it's not atomic. It's not made up of atoms. So, you know, your body is made up of atoms. Mostly your body is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. That's about 96% of your body, and then the rest of your body is other things, sulfur, phosphorus, all the elements of the periodic table, which incidentally were manufactured in stars. So the carbon in your fingernails, the oxygen going to your brain right now, all these come from different stars. Your body is star stuff. It's the dust of stars, your physical body. But so is everything else, this table, this microphone. Anything that you can see or perceive is made up of atoms. But dark matter is not made up of atoms. And it's 26% of the universe. So what's it made of? And the answer is, of course, we don't know, because that's why it's an open question. Then why do we call it matter? If it's not visible, if it's not hard like this, why do we call matter? Because it has the same effect as regular matter in that it produces <coughs> or is responsible for most of the gravity in a galaxy. So we are a planet in the solar system. The solar system is part of a galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy. If you want, you can look at it tonight when you go out. You know, it's, um, it's a huge strip of stars. The Milky Way galaxy has about 100 billion stars. Each star has its own planets. At the moment, um, scientists believe there are two trillion galaxies. Two trillion galaxies. You can't even count that number. And there are 700 sextillion stars. Again, unfathomable. Okay, and there are trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of uncountable planets. So, a galaxy, we are in, I said, in um, the Milky Way galaxy right next door to us is another galaxy called Andromeda. The next door is Virgo, on and on and on and on. These days they just give uh, names and numbers to these galaxies when scientists discover them. But most of the gravity, most of the gravity that holds the galaxy together is this dark matter. If it weren't for this dark matter, a galaxy would fall apart, the planets would spin off into and get lost into intergalactic space. They would disappear. You and I would fall apart. So whatever this dark matter is, it's holding the galaxy together and therefore the solar system, the planets, you and me. So that's now 96% of the universe, which is unaccountable, invisible. <clears throat> that leaves 4% of the universe, which is made up of atoms. Of that 4% of the universe, which is made up of atoms, 99.99% is invisible interstellar dust. So we can't see that either. The visible universe with 2 trillion galaxies, 700 sextillion stars, and trillions of planets is 0.01%. So everything we can see, 
or we can infer through all these experiments is 0.01%. The rest is unknown, possibly unknowable. If it doesn't, if it's not atomic, your body is made of atoms, how can we ever know it? So what we have is a great mystery, 0.01% of the universe is visible. Now here's the situation. When you look at the atomic universe, I don't know how many of you are interested in science, but atoms, as you know, are made up of particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, these days, many other different kinds of particles, bosons, gluons, quarks. So when you look at these particles, you find that they have a dual nature. If you're looking for them, if you're looking at them, and if they're interacting with other particles, <coughs> if they are in relationship with other particles, then they appear as material entities. They are physical entities. They have units of mass and energy. Very small, but still units of mass and energy. That's what they do at, at CERN, look at these subatomic particles through these big experiments. But if you're not observing an atom or a, or a particle, or if it's not interacting with other particles, then it disappears. And what does it disappear into? It disappears into what scientists call waves. So particles are things, but waves are all over the place. And if you ask scientists, what are these waves made of? What are the waves that make physical particles? What are they made of? Because, you know, every child wants to know, what's this made of? What is this made of? And we are all curious beings. We want to know, what are the waves that make physical <coughs> particles made of? Like when you see the ocean, the waves are made of water. The air waves that are carrying sound right now from me to you are made of air molecules. But what are the waves that make physical particles made of, which make atoms, which make molecules, which make everything from microphones to human bodies to crocodiles and trees? What are the waves that make physical matter, what are they made of? And the best answer you'll get are they are made of possibilities. Possibilities. A possibility is not a thing, right? It's a potential. So then you ask scientists, <clears throat> where do these possibility waves exist? Where do these possibility waves exist? And they'll tell you they exist in something called Hilbert space. I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can. Okay, so then you say, what is Hilbert space? And you find out that Hilbert is the name of a mathematician. So Hilbert space is named after Hilbert. You see, okay, I get it. What is Hilbert space? It houses the wave functions, the possibility waves. So the possibility waves exist in this space. Then you say, but where is it? And the best answer you'll get from science today is shut up and calculate. <laughs> the science works, but we don't know what this Hilbert space is. Obviously, it's a space in mathematical imagination. It's a theoretical space. And actually, it's not even a space, because even space-time comes from it, according to science. Bottom line, what's the universe made of? Best answer, made of nothing. OK? This is the best answer that science can give you. What is the universe made of? It's made of nothing. 
what is nothing? Don't know. But it seems like it becomes everything. Okay? So what I'm saying to you right now is not, um, is not metaphysics, it's not philosophy, it's today's science. There's a big book out uh, called The Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss, who is a very famous physicist who studies the origins of the universe. The universe is made of nothing. Okay. That's science question, open question number one. The second question in science is, what is the biological nature of consciousness? Why is this such a difficult question? In fact, it's called the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, again, anything I say, you can go on the, these days you can do a library search and find out anything. So you can go again on the internet and say, hard problem of consciousness. So what is the biological basis of consciousness? Now, you can see just in the question, there's an assumption. And the assumption is, consciousness is a product of biology. Right? The question assumes that. When you say, what is the biological basis of consciousness? The question itself assumes that consciousness is produced by biology, principally the brain. <clears throat> So why do people believe that, number one? Why do scientists believe that, number one? Well, if you knock somebody on the head, they lose consciousness, right? If you give somebody um, anesthesia, um, every day people get anesthesia, they get operations, apparently they lose consciousness. If they're in a coma, they lose consciousness. If they're dead, certainly they're not conscious, at least that's what we think. There's no evidence that they're conscious. So most scientists believe, it. there's some, I met an anesthesiologist yesterday in this course. Where is she? She's, uh, where are you? Stand up, please. There she is. Okay, so we were talking about this yesterday very briefly. So every time she puts somebody to sleep, they lose consciousness with whatever they do. But I think what they lose is conscious experience. They don't lose consciousness, and that's a different thing. But by and large, everybody believes that the brain produces consciousness for the reasons I just told you. So how does it do that? You know, first of all, you know, we know that your gallbladder produces bile, your pancreas produces pancreatic juice, your uh, stomach produces hydrochloric acid. So biologists say the brain produces consciousness. But we've been talking about consciousness since yesterday, and we are defining consciousness as that in which all experience occurs, right? That in which uh, all perception occurs, thought occurs, sensations, images. I mentioned the acronym SIFT, sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, which is what we experience all the time. So um, how does the brain produce that? Because all that's there in the brain is, if you look inside the brain, all there is is electricity and chemicals. What we see inside the brain are electrochemical <clears throat> electrochemical activity. So let's try and take that a little bit deeper into our understanding. We t yesterday I spoke to you about where are you having the experience of seeing me, right? You remember? Okay, so photons are coming to your eyes, they're going into your retina, they're causing chemical reactions, that's sending an electrical impulse, it's called an action potential to your brain. In your brain there are neurochemical activities 
but you don't experience any of that. What do you experience? You experience this. You experience this room. You experience these lights. You experience color. You experience shape. You experience solidity and liquidity and all kinds of sounds. It's a pretty mushy experience, the universe. You know, sounds and sensations and images and feelings and thoughts and tastes and smells. How do chemicals produce that? So you are scientists. How do they do that? How do chemicals produce this experience? And the best answer you'll get from scientists, we don't know, but we'll figure it out. Um, because, you know, that's the history of science. We keep looking for answers to questions by doing experiments. But we don't know how chemicals or atoms produce experience. Any experience. It doesn't matter what the experience. When you're listening to music, what's going to your brain is an electrical current. When you're tasting a banana, what's going to your brain is an electrical current. When you have any other emotional experience, you fall in love, what's going to your brain is an electrical current. And what's happening in your brain is a chemical reaction. So how does that produce experience? And as I told you, scientists say we don't know. That's why it's called the hard problem of consciousness. That's the phrase. When you have time, Google it. Hard problem of consciousness. Now I'm talking not only about perceptual experience, I'm talking about even mental experience. So. Uh, just now think of a beautiful sunset on the mountains. Do you, do you have an experience? You can see something? Some picture? Well, there's no picture in your brain. All there is is chemicals. Think of um, the sound of the voice of your mother. Can you hear it? You have an experience, right? There's no sound in the brain. All there is is a chemical reaction. Think of your favorite song, John Lennon, Imagine. You hear it. There's no sound in the brain. Think of anything. All there is in the brain is a chemical reaction. So, that's why we call it the hard problem of consciousness. We cannot explain how we experience anything, including our own body. Because our body is an experience right now. You're having the experience that you have a body. I have a body. Or your mind. Can't explain it. Now, there is something called the easy problem of consciousness, and that has been solved. The easy problem is that when you have an experience, there's a chemical reaction or an electrochemical reaction to that experience in your brain. So when you're seeing there's an electrochemical reaction in... Uh, your occipital cortex. When you're hearing, there's an electrochemical reaction in your auditory cortex, etc. So these electrochemical reactions in the body, they are called the neural correlates of consciousness, NCC. So every, every experience we have, there's a neural correlate, which you can see on a CAT scan or a brain scan. These days there's lots of amazing technology that allows you to look at the brain when somebody's having a thought or an emotion or a perceptual experience. These are called neural correlates of consciousness. Correlates. 
they are not called neural causes of consciousness because we don't know if these chemical reactions produce consciousness or experience. We don't know. All we know, there's some correspondence. But just for a moment, think about this. Even the neural correlate is an experience, right? Even the brain is an experience. When you're looking at the brain, that's an experience. So it all gets very mysterious. But the fact is, we do not know the origins of consciousness. Just as we do not know how the universe came out of nothing, we do not know the origins of consciousness. And since yesterday we've been exploring consciousness in different ways, and we've come to one conclusion, that consciousness is not a thing, it's formless. You remember? So consciousness, like the universe, is made of nothing. The universe is made of nothing, and consciousness is made of nothing. Could there be a connection that nothing interacting with nothing produces everything? When I say nothing interacting with nothing, I imply two different kinds of nothing. Could they be the same nothing? In other words, nothing interacting with nothing produces everything. And by nothing, just break down the word, no thing. No thing, that's what nothing means. No thing becomes all things. Okay, so this is where we are today in science. Now let's backtrack and see how human beings have thought about this mystery for ever since they started thinking. Okay. Now, just to give you a little backdrop, because, you know, every day, uh, these days, everything is kind of um, scientific. There are all kinds of scientists, biologists, evolutionary biologists, anthropologists, cosmologists, physicists, mathematicians, etc. So, of course, science is the latest way in which we try to understand reality. But human beings have thought about reality from, for a long time, and this has been kind of the sequence. Divine universe, God created the universe. Who or what is God? Well, most people think of God as some kind of a dead white male, huh? <laughs> somewhere in the sky with a beard, sitting there in judgment. Um, but in any case, in every religion, there's been a God. And God has been imagined as some kind of a superhuman, some kind of a supernatural entity. For most of humanity, um, or for most of, let's say, humanity's history, that's been how human beings have thought of the universe. <clears throat> By the way, there's something very interesting I want to share with you, which um, anyone read the book Sapiens? You read the book? Very good book. Israeli deep historian from Oxford, now lives in Israel. So deep historians go into deep history <laughs> all the way back. And according to um, these deep historians, up until, say, 20, 30,000 years ago, there were eight different kinds of humans. So there were eight different types of human species, but they all came from the human family, just like a cat and a lion and a panther and a cheetah and um, what else? Hmm? Your house cat, your lion, lion, cheetah, tiger, leopard, they're all the same family, but they're different species. Okay? And how do you define a species? A species mates only with its own kind. So you won't see a panther mating with a tiger. <clears throat> but it's still the same family. 
So up until 20, 30,000 years ago, there were eight different kinds of humans. We are homo sapiens, <clears throat> which means the wise ones. It's a name we gave to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but then <laughs> we gave names to other humans, and uh, such as Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalis, Homo floroensis, I forget all the others, but there are many kinds. And they all had a very rudimentary language. You know, how did language first come about? You know, because before language, there were only sounds. That's a sound. That's a sound. This is a sound. S sound. And nature is full of sounds. Birds are making sounds. Animals, we say growl, etc. The cry of a wolf, all these sounds. So sounds are basically what the alphabet sounds like, right? K, k, g, t. And then the vowel sounds, u, e, o, um. But you hear them in nature, these sounds. So all organisms, particularly humans and primates, elephants and other animals started to communicate through sound. Even dolphins communicate through sound, different kinds of sounds. In the case of, in the case of whales, it's infrasonic, etc. And uh, you know, some species hear ultrasound and things like that. But they started to communicate through sound. Humans had a very primitive language. And the language was about two things. Danger, f three things. Danger, food, sex. Why? Because these are the three things you need to know about in order to survive. If there's a tiger coming, then you better watch out. Because the tiger is going to eat you up. There's food there, OK? There's the opportunity to have sex and mate and reproduce. So very basic language. Danger calls, mating calls, food calls. But then one species, us, developed a language first for gossip. OK, so instead of saying food, so-and-so is sleeping with so-and-so. <laughs> so-and-so can be trusted. So-and-so cannot be trusted. So-and-so is a good person, honorable. Guess what that led to? That led to stories. So we became storytellers. OK? We are the only species who tell stories. We write stories. Scientific stories, stories about culture, etc. And once we started writing stories and telling stories, we actually vanquished all the other humans because the other humans could never, they, all animals move in packs, you know, whether it's uh, the cat family or wolves or, or hyenas or elephants, they move in packs, and the leader of the pack could never get more than a few dozen followers. Humans could never get more than a hundred followers. But then, when they started telling stories, they got millions of followers. Millions. You can't tell a monkey, give me your banana, and then monkey heaven, you'll get a billion bananas. <clears throat> but you can tell human beings that. And they'll go and commit suicide and become bombers or whatever. So as soon as we started telling stories, we got rid of all the other species. Because this led to <clears throat> everything that we call civilization, art, architecture, music, literature, science, technology, money. Money is a story, right? 
It's a piece of paper which says, I, you give you this piece of paper and you can buy an automobile or you know, buy food with it. <clears throat> so it's an agreement on what we value. Money is a story. Commerce, kingdoms, monarchs, countries, nations, all these came about as an, as through the ability to of humans to make stories. So then they started making stories about the origin of the universe. And the first story was God. The second story, as you'll see, is the classical universe. The third, the relativistic universe. The fourth, the quantum universe. The fifth, the human universe. And now we are saying, actually, you are the universe. That the, there is a, the universe is a made-up construct. That there is no universe. It's you that is experiencing something and interpreting that as the universe. But let's track this a little bit, okay? So this is the first story. God created the universe and is the source and origin of life and mind. <coughs> That's the Sistine Chapel. By the way, I had the opportunity recently to uh, teach a group of priests at the Vatican meditation in the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> was a great experience. Um, I just joined the board of the Vatican as an advisor for science and technology. So it's not a, it's not <laughs> a big deal. There are a lot of people. Uh, but it's, it's a testimony to Pope Francis that he wants to do this. OK, so this, <clears throat> this universe it was the story of humans, humans are storytellers, till about the appearance of Isaac Newton. And those are the dates. And uh, Isaac Newton was actually a uh, Christian. He believed in the Bible. But he also believed that God, whatever that entity is, God created the laws of of nature, as he called them. They were called, scientists at that time were called natural philosophers. And so um, Isaac Newton um, says that the universe is created and ruled by fixed laws of nature that can be known through human reason and logic. You don't have to believe in anything. You just have to reason it out. But of course, you see the missing element here is, so reason is based on thought, but nobody's asking, where does thought come from? But never mind that at the moment. During uh, Isaac Newton's time, there were these other great luminaries, Leibniz, Descartes, Spinoza, Voltaire, Voltaire, great minds. I think for the moment, we should just talk about René Descartes, the French philosopher. <clears throat> who came up with the theory of what we call dualism. So dualism, and you probably remember the famous phrase everybody's heard, I think, therefore I am. Okay, so according to Descartes, there's a mental and spiritual world, and then there's a physical world. And the two are different. Okay, and that's why it's called dualism. Mind and spirit, one realm, and the other is physical. Dualism was very popular at the time of these great philosophers and the time of, of um, Isaac Newton. Partly because it satisfied a lot of intellectual discourse at that time from what people knew about it. And secondly, it was also political. Uh, the Pope basically said, you scientists, you can take care of the physical world and we guys will take care of the, it was all guys anyway, uh, we guys will take care of the mental and spiritual. So it's kind of a peaceful uh, settlement between the two, the priests and the scientists. But nobody believes in dualism anymore. Because if there are two different entities, mind, spirit on one side, and then the physical, then how do they interact? 
Okay, how does a thought create a physical manifestation? Simple idea. Lift your hand up like this. That's what starts with a thought, right? What happens here is physical. So how does a thought, which is not a physical entity, you know, you can't weigh a thought, you can't measure a thought in terms of units of mass and energy, how does a thought, which is something outside of the physical realm, cause physical effects? Whatever it is, movement of muscles, volition, choice, speaking, you know, it all starts with a thought, and then here it is. So, today, dualism is not fashionable because it cannot be scientifically justified. Furthermore, without going into de details, it violates the laws of conservation of energy. So where does the energy come from um, for a thought to cause physical effects? Okay, so nobody believes in dualism anymore. I just want you to know that there are very few people who look at examining reality, who believe in these, that there are two different entities, which leaves out what is called monism. There's only one reality. And so now in that monism, there are two camps. One camp says it's all physical. Everything is physical. Thought somehow is a mystery, but the brain produces thought, which I've already told you that we can't prove that. We don't know how. We'll find out. So monism is either it's all physical or the other is it's all mental, spiritual. It's all one thing. But it's one thing. Whatever reality is, it's one thing. That's monism. Okay, this model of, it's a model of reality, um, actually persisted until very recently. Give me five more minutes, huh? So this uh, model persisted until recently. It persisted until the last century. This model of reality still works. So if, um, if we have landed men on the moon, if we have put people on Mars, if we have automobiles and jet planes, all based on the laws of physics. And not only the laws of physics, on the classical laws of physics that Isaac Newton created almost 300 years ago. It's amazing. His mind was amazing. Okay, see, so these are laws of motion, gravitation, planetary motion, objects on Earth and celestial bodies, laws of thermodynamics, and all that until this guy showed up. And he said uh, the old model was obsolete. So now we're going to take a short three-minute break. Gabrielle, you can come. We decided you shouldn't sit for more than one hour, so we'll take a stretch. Okay, so now we've come to the last century, um, Close call. tracking this whole history. Einstein published two theories. One is called the special theory of relativity. The other is called the general theory of relativity. So one was 1905, the other is 1915. By the way, he got the Nobel Prize, not for these theories, but for something called the photoelectric effect. So next time you're in the elevator here, and you're trying to get in, and the door is opening or closing, but you go inside the space between the doors, and it suddenly opens, that's the photoelectric effect. That's what he got the Nobel Prize for, how photons you know, create the electrical effect, and we use it in all our technology today. He didn't get it for these two amazing theories. So what is the special theory of relativity? 
without going into details, the speed of light is fixed at 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, it is constant for all frames of reference. Matter and energy are interconvertible. So small amounts of matter have huge amounts of energy. That's the basis of the atomic bomb. Okay, uh, so the atomic bomb came about as a result of this theory. Then 1915, he published the general theory of relativity, which is more about a new theory of gravity. Uh, so took away Einstein's idea of gravity and said gravity is a distortion in space-time. So gravity is a curvature in space-time. And this led, even though he didn't know, it led ultimately to all the theories of black holes and uh, gravitational time delay, which means that as we get closer to a black hole, gravity becomes very intense, and so does time slow down. And when you enter the, what is called the event horizon, when you're very close to the black hole, then uh, time stops. Now, it's very difficult to imagine all this because it's all based on mathematics. But a few years ago, um, when um, Stephen Hawking was 70 years of age, they had, a, in New York, they had a celebration at the science festival for him as a birthday celebration because he described black holes. They had a ballet and a philharmonic orchestra uh, to kind of explain black holes and time and so on. It was an amazing play. You know, you have these ballet dancers and the story is that uh, there's a spaceship which is about the size of a city, literally the size of a city, that is traveling through intergalactic space to another galaxy, which is millions of light years away. Millions of light years away. And the, the, the ship is the size of a city, many floors and many different things. And um, the captain of the ship has a son. The idea is that they'll get to this other galaxy after many generations. So they have to live in this spaceship for millions of years, generation after generation. It's all set to music with ballet dancers and everything, and the captain has a son by the name of Icarus. You know the story of Icarus, right? So um, the captain explains to Icarus that a black hole <coughs> occurs when a giant star exhausts its thermonuclear energy and starts collapsing on itself till it disappears to a point of zero volume and infinite density. So nothing can escape from it, not even light. That's why it's called a black hole. Around the black hole, there's an event horizon, about 12 kilometers outside the black hole, there's an event horizon. And if you're looking at events from this side, from our side of the event horizon, then when a photon of light gets to the event horizon, it takes eternity for the, for the photon to travel from the event horizon to the black hole. Eternity. Because everything slows down. If something takes eternity to cross 12 kilometers, it means it's stuck forever, right? But if you're observing the same event from the other side, then the photon zips right through, enters the black hole, goes through a wormhole, and shows up in another universe in a different dimension of space and time. That's the theory, and now we know there are black holes even in our own, every galaxy has a black hole, okay? So all this was based on mathematics that came from Einstein. So the captain of the ship tells Icarus, listen, 
we're going to be crossing the vicinity of many black holes as we go through these different galaxies. I want you to be careful. Don't mess with the black hole because then I'll never see you again. And I don't want to lose you. Icarus is 12 years old. And one day he's playing with his computers on the ship. And um, he spots a gravitational effect that he knows there's a black hole close by. So he goes to the docking station. Of course, he knows his father has told him not to mess, but he's curious. He's 12 years old. So he gets into this little space shuttle, a little spaceship, like, you know, you have big, when you have big cruisers, you have little boats. And so he gets into this. He leaves the mothership, and he's soon floating in intergalactic space. He identifies through his computers where the black hole is, and he heads for the black hole, gets to the event horizon, and then imagine the event horizon is like the rim of a funnel that tapers into a black hole where time stops. So he gets right to the rim, and he's a very good, skillful navigator. He kind of skirts the rim. It's like the razor's edge. He could go in and disappear forever or he could slip out. But he manages to go around it once without slipping either way. And then he just skirts around it once, and then he pulls off the gravitational field. And he gets back on his computers. He radios his dad. He says, Dad, I did it. There's no response. He says, Dad. There's no response. You can imagine the music and the ballet dancers and all this. He says, Dad. And he starts to cry because there's no response. And so he's 12 years old. He, he stops messing with his computers. The spaceship drifts off and gets lost in interstellar space. And then a little time goes by, and suddenly he sees a galaxy. Um, a different galaxy. And he gets on his computers, he gets into this galaxy, he enters their gravitational field, he finds a planet, he looks at all these stars, and finally he lands his little spaceship on this planet. And all those people who are living there, they come and to look at him and the planet, and the, and the spaceship. And they welcome him and all that. He's a 12-year-old kid. But then they look at his spaceship and they said, where did you get that spaceship from? He says, um, it's the spaceship of, you know, the mother spaceship, which was um, my father's big spaceship. And they said, you know, that model went out a few hundred million years ago. Okay, so a few hundred million years had passed for those people, and all he did was take one circle around the black hole. Now, this, of course, was a play in science fiction, but this is today's science. Okay, so what does the general theory of relativity also tell us? It tells us that the universe is very dynamic, that space, time, matter are all interdependent. They are the same thing. Now, space is nothing, right? Time is a very abstract thing. Where is time? Where is yesterday? Where is a century ago? Where is a thousand years from now? And so Einstein came to this remarkable conclusion that space, time, and matter are actually the same thing. But he didn't know what it was. And in 1930, he met this great Indian poet. My book starts with that whole story. He met this great Indian poet, Tagore, who was not only a poet, but he was a seer, and he understood consciousness. And the two of them met in a little town called Potsdam. And um, they discussed the nature of reality. And so Einstein was what scientists, philosophers of science call, a realist. Realist means that the world is real. 
and Tagore was what they call an idealist. Idealist goes back to the time of Plato, which means the world is made of ideas, basically. In other words, the world is a projection of ideas from human consciousness. They had a very respectful dialogue, lasted a few uh, hours, was reported in the New York Times, and then the war broke off. Broke, you know, the war broke, Second World War, Nazism came, and the whole conversation was lost. I happened to find that conversation, and um, it was actually the basis of the new book. Tagore and Einstein talking about the nature of reality. So around Einstein's time, there were these other great physicists, Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrodinger, Max Planck, Paul Dirac, Werner Heisenberg, and they pioneered what we call quantum physics and quantum mechanics. Albert Einstein was a reluctant participant in the development of the theories of quantum mechanics, which is mathematical again, okay? Reluctant, why? Because as we'll see when we go into quantum mechanics, there's something called non-locality, where everything is instantly correlated with everything, which basically violates the laws of relativity. So he couldn't adjust to this whole idea that everything in the universe is entangled with everything else in the universe, something we call quantum entanglement. So if you affect the universe, you do something here, and something in a distant part of the universe in a different location of space-time instantly responds. And so <clears throat> Einstein kind of ridiculed that as spooky action at a distance. And that became a very famous phrase, his ridiculing of what we now call non-locality. So what are the bases of quantum physics? Again, in, without going to the math, the most important is that um, without observation, the world remains possibilities. That's called the Copenhagen interpretation because all these scientists used to meet in Copenhagen, which was the home of Niels Bohr, who was the father of quantum physics. One of these people, Erwin Schrodinger, you've heard of Schrodinger's cat and Schrodinger's equation. Well, Schrodinger was a Vedantist. He used to, was a st student of Vedanta, everything that we're discussing. So the most important thing here is some of the things that we've been kind of discussing, that you know, particles and waves are the same thing. There's something called non-locality, that the fundamental nature of the universe is that it's non-local. Everything is connected to everything. Everything is inseparable. Uh, observation causes collapse of wave function. The movement of atoms is random, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this became the basis of all our technology today. So today, when you use your iPhone or your Android, when you use a computer, when you uh, use Twitter or Facebook or any of the technologies that we use today, they're based on the calculations of quantum mechanics. In other words, it works. Okay, we wouldn't have our modern technology without the mathematics of quantum mechanics. But then there's something called interpretations of quantum mechanics. Remember, I used the word shut up and calculate. That's a very popular word in, amongst physicists, that the calculations work. And if you shut up and just do the math, you might get a, your tenure, you'll get a professorship, your career will um, uh, be furthered, uh, you uh, might get a grant from the government, you might even win the Nobel Prize. But don't ask, what does it mean? Okay, what, is, what does it mean? That is, how do we interpret this? So what are interpretations? Interpretations are sets of statements which attempt to explain quantum mechanics beyond the recipes it gives for performing 
calculations. So philosophers of science, such as Schrodinger, Everett, Born, all these, Born, by the way, was the German German uh, mathematician who also got the a physicist who got the Nobel Prize. He was the great grandfather, or no, grandfather of Olivia Newton John, the singer. Um, she told me that. Um, <laughs> so these guys were more interested in what does this whole thing mean? Okay, what's going on? As I mentioned, the Copenhagen interpretation is the most popular, was until recently. And um, what is the Copenhagen interpretation? Unless there's a conscious being looking at the universe, it doesn't actually exist. That's the Copenhagen interpretation. It remains possibilities. Then a conscious being looks at it and it becomes this. For humans, this, but for other species, we don't know what even though we can have relationship. You can have a relationship with your dog or your cat, but you don't actually know what they're seeing or what they're experiencing. The relationship is in consciousness, right? So this was the... Go to Wikipedia, and these are the interpretations of quantum physics. More than 20. So more than 20 different schools explaining what's going on. And they all work with the same math. So the math works no matter what interpretation you choose. When you have 25 interpretations of the same mathematics, then one thing is sure, no one knows what's going on. <laughs> okay? Everybody disagrees about everything except the math. So I mentioned to you the most, the most popular interpretation was Copenhagen. Niels Bohr and all those luminaries that I showed you. Until recently. And why until recently? Because most modern day physicists are realists and they are also atheists. And they actually use the term militant atheists. That they think if you believe in God or something like that, you know, that's all woo-woo. It's not real, and you're stupid, basically. So they try to avoid consciousness as an explanation. So as I said, until recently, that was the most. So now there are all these 25. But the most important one, the one that most scientists subscribe to at the moment, is something called eternal inflation. So, you know, a few years ago, I asked um, Joel Premack, who is one of the physicists who described dark matter. He's at the University of California. I said, I don't understand eternal inflation. The math is too difficult. Can you explain it to me? Eternal inflation was first proposed by a Russian cosmologist who is um, now at Stanford, but usually uh, originally from Mas Moscow. So the mathematics came from him. His name is Andre Linde. This is the explanation I got. Imagine there's a casino outside of space-time, a cosmic casino bigger than Las Vegas. And imagine that in this cosmic casino, there are an infinity of slot machines. And each slot machine is throwing up coins randomly, randomly because no guard, no consciousness, nothing like that. So it has to be random. And these mach machines are throwing up coins. This is a metaphor, of course, to explain the math. And if the coin comes back heads up, it doubles in size. If the coin comes back tails up, it halves in size. Now imagine a scenario where you have an infinity of tails. So tail, 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 tail. Almost an infinite number of times. So every time the coin gets reduced in size till it becomes Planck size. Planck size is the smallest size you can imagine. 10 to the power of minus 37 centimeters. Okay, it's a size that is invisible. 
it's about the size of a quantum fluctuation. So in the, in the cosmic casino, there are holes, little holes, which are Planck size. This quantum fluctuation uh, escapes the casino and spins off into a universe. And because this uh, casino has an infinite number of slot machines, actually infinite casinos, infinite coins, and this happened for this happening for all eternity, then every once in a while there's the birth of a universe. In fact, there may be an infinite number of universes by now. The math works. But will we ever be able to prove this theory? No, because what they're talking about is immeasurable. You can't measure. Once you get to Planck's says scale, nothing is measurable. It's basically math. So does quantum physics explain the universe? No. It's a way of calculating and a nice way to create computers and transistors and all of that, but doesn't explain what's going on. This is where we are today. Okay, Copenhagen is explained. So basically, everything that people are talking about is mathematical guessing games. In fact, there's a book now from uh, person called Max Tegmark, who's the head of mathematics and physics at MIT, and his book is called The Mathematical Universe. He says if something can be proved mathematically, then it exists. Somewhere it exists. Okay? But will we ever be able to document that? There's no theoretical way that we can. Okay, so basically we have reached a dead end. We have reached a dead end principally because, first of all, the whole universe that's visible is 0.01%. And ultimately, um, we have to come to some other theory, which leads to the latest theory, that the universe is consciousness, that random events may not be enough to explain the fine-tuning of the laws of nature and the rise of life on Earth. <clears throat> so about five years ago, I had this debate with the most de prominent atheist of our time, Richard Dawkins, who is um, a professor at Oxford of evolutionary biology, very f famous. If you haven't heard of him, then you haven't read his books, God Delusion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he's very prominent, okay? And he's he's the leader of the atheist movement. And so we were invited to have a debate, a conversation in Mexico. You can find it on the internet if you want. If you look up Richard Dawkins, Deepak Chopra, you'll find it. And it was a very interesting two-hour conversation. But I mentioned to him um, this idea that the universe is an expression of consciousness. And he was very upset. I quoted, uh, I quoted Freeman Dyson, who is now 93 years old and still teaching at uh, Princeton University, one of the only living people since uh, Einstein, sharp as, very sharp, British like Dawkins. Uh, he's in, um, he was in Cambridge, now it's in uh, Princeton. So I quoted uh, Dyson in the debate. You saw it apparently on the internet. And he screamed at me. He should, uh, first of all, Dyson didn't say that. Secondly, he should sue you. And he was all, I was afraid he was going to get a stroke. He was so upset. <laughs> you see these, these militant atheists, it's not rational. It's None of this is part of the conversation. It's very emotional. They're rebelling against their parents who told them there's God or something like that. You know, it's, it's a childhood thing, which is very emotional. It's not about rationality or physics. It's about their dad or their mother or something. You know? So he got very upset with me. And afterwards, he said, Dyson should sue you. 
So I actually email Dyson. These days, that's the other thing. You can find anybody, and you can find their email, and you can send them. So I said, Dr. Dawkins said, you should sue me, because I said, you think we live in a conscious universe. And Dyson actually responded to me and to Dawkins, and I've saved that email for future generations. <laughs> uh, he said, three things have, have uh, three riddles, very precise language, three riddles have occupied me um, throughout my life. Now, number one, a universe that is fine-tuned for life and for mind. So the universe is, if the math was off by one fraction of a second, one decimal point here or there, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Okay. So universe fine-tuned for mind and life. The second, he said, the unpredictable movement of atoms. He didn't use the word random. He said unpredictable. Random means that the movement of atoms is inherently random. Unpredictable means I don't know what's going on. Okay, it's like going to Grand Central Station and everything seems random, but everybody's going somewhere, right? Some, some people are going to Philadelphia, some people are going to New York. So it's not inherently random, it's unpredictable to me, the observer, you know. Somebody's going there. It all seems totally chaotic. But there's purpose behind each of these movements. So he said the unpredictable movement of atoms. And the second riddle. And the third riddle is our own consciousness. He said, I don't know the connection between these three riddles, but I know there's a connection. And that was sincerely yours, Freeman Dyson. P.S. I have no intention of suing anyone. <laughs> okay. So I've saved that email. But this, this leads us to where we are right now. Okay. Physics and math cannot explain this experience we're having. Nor can biology explain this experience we're having. So we've got to start thinking in totally different ways, which became the basis of my book, You Are the Universe. And I want to do this in a very gentle way. So without now going into, we have a little bit of limited time. So if I ask you, what is this? You're going to say it's an iPhone. If I ask you this, what's this? It's a shoe. If I ask you, what's this? This is a hand. If I ask you, what's this? It's a body. If I ask you, what's this? It's a statue. And what I'm proposing to you right now is these are human constructs for modes of knowing and experience in our consciousness. These are human constructs for modes of knowing an experience in human consciousness. First of all, no other species would have this experience. They wouldn't say this is a statue, or this is a phone, that's a shoe. Okay, not even a child would have. You want to show that little video of the baby? So my daughter sent me this. She found this on uh, some a Facebook page of a friend of hers, a close friend of hers.
So what do you see in that, in that video? All you see is curiosity, wonder, even mystery. Do you see that? There's a sense of mystery. What's, what's going on, all right? And there's also a little bit of joy, wonder. That's an essential state of a human being. Till we come up with a construct. You're not supposed to eat that. That's a toy. This is your hand. This is your body. Okay, and your name is uh, whatever. It's Indian or Canadian Indian. <laughs> and you're a male and you're a Hindu. And now you have a construct. A human construct for basic experience, which is what? Curiosity, wonder, joy, awe, mystery, colors, shapes, textures, smells. This is what experience is. But by giving names to the experience, we have created a construct. That's an object. This is a body. And this is a human being. And where is that construct created? Of course, in consciousness. It's the giving words to modes of experience and modes of knowing. And what is the mode? What is knowing what? It's consciousness knowing itself as this experience. So this baby is what? Less than a year old? Okay, now guess what happens by the time the baby is eight years old. And that's my precocious grandson. Okay, so let's show that video um, after you've been bamboozled. <laughs> bamboozled by what we call education. So this was his uh, graduation speech, and he's not even yet in elementary. He hasn't finished elementary school when he finished his last school, whatever. Okay, so very early in life, we create constructs. And then, you know, as you get older, you become Stephen Hawking, you become Einstein. Then you say space-time, galaxies, stars, gluons, bosons, quarks, particles. Are these things real or are they names for experience? What is the experience? The experience is what we call qualia, a quality of consciousness. Color, shape, form, appearance, sound. And what are qualia? They're qualities of consciousness modifying itself as experience. So, there is no such thing as a universe. There is no such thing as a body. There is no such thing as a mind. All there is, is consciousness modulating itself as experience, which we call qualia, which are both perceptual and mental. And then we give words to these experiences and we construct the human universe. So all human knowledge is rooted in consciousness. And our knowledge is also very limited because of the limitations of what we call the brain. You know, you can't experience most of what we call reality, infrared, ultraviolet, you know, ultrasound, infrasonic, or whatever, supersonic. We develop instruments to explore these realms. But 
reality is infinite. And it localizes in us as this experience. And we are the conscious agents who create reality in our own image. And what we call God or the universe or a body or a mind are just labels that we give to modes of knowing and modes of experience which are modifications of our own self. Why is this important? This is important because very consistent with Vedanta, by the way, but also a new kind of spin on it. This is important because we are, you know, as you look at the causes of human suffering across eons of time, human suffering comes because, first of all, we don't know what reality is. Number two, we are clinging and holding on to something that's very transient. It's, it's an appearance and a disappearance. We are also afraid of impermanence. We identify with an ego, which is another construct, and we are afraid of death. Those are called the five kleshas, the five causes of human suffering. And the wisdom traditions tell us that all these causes of suffering would disappear if we understood what is real. What is real is that which knows, that which tries to figure it out. That is consciousness itself. And since that consciousness is not in time, it is eternal. You don't have to have the constructs of death, because death happens to an experience, not to you. Everything OK? Sorry, there's just a button on the thing that you have to hit in order to turn it off. OK. So if you could know what is real, you would not be afraid of death. Okay, so let's, let's talk just a few minutes. We have still a few minutes left. We say this body is real, right? You can touch it, feel it, etc. Now close your eyes and just experience your body right now with your eyes closed. In other words, feel your body. Open your eyes. What did you experience when you closed your eyes and felt the body? What did you experience? Hmm? Sensation, right? Some energy, some vibration, but some sensation. More of us. Moreover, the sensation was all kind of diffuse, amorphous, something here, something here, something here. If you weren't familiar with the word body, like that baby, okay? Its eyes are closed. What's it experiencing? Sensations. Where are the sensations coming from? Consciousness. What are they? They are modified forms of consciousness. Consciousness modifying itself as this sensation. Now look at your body. What are you experiencing? Don't say my body. What you're experiencing is a shape, a color, a form. You're experiencing qualia, qualities of consciousness. They're modified forms of consciousness. So what is your body? Body is an intermittent stream of sensations, sense perceptions. Intermittent. Is it a thing? Did you have the same sensation and perception of this 10 years ago? Or when you said, I was a child, it was a different experience, right? So this is not a thing. This is an activity of consciousness modulating itself as this experience. 
if you just replace the word body with experience. And what is the experience? Sensations and sense perceptions, which are modified forms of consciousness. Everything that we call the physical world is like that. It's an intermittent stream of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. So there is nothing that you can call a thing. Everything that you call a thing is an activity. And some of that activity recycles in the same pattern. So it looks like the same thing. You know, when you walk out of here, this building is not suddenly going to show up as a dinosaur. Okay? But at one time, it did show up at this, this location, did show up as a dinosaur or what we call a dinosaur, another human construct. Okay, so as you look through a bigger lens, then you say nothing stands still. Not your body, not this building, not what you call a tree or a mountain or a galaxy or a quark. It's an activity. And what's it an activity of? It's a quality of awareness. The experience that you're having is in time, but that which is modulating its ex itself as experience is not in time at all. Because it's awareness, it has no form, it's nothing. And what is that nothing? It's you. It's you interacting with yourself to experience this. Now, in the beginning, that can be very scary. But as you get comfortable with it and you know it, then you know that you're an immortal being, a timeless being, and that even death is an illusion. In the same way as birth is an illusion. Birth and death happen every moment. Why? Because there's appearance and then there's disappearance. Last night's dream, there was appearances and disappearances, right? Things appearing and things disappearing. Well, the same thing is happening right now. Things are appearing and disappearing. Not only things that you see as the outside world, but your own body, your own mind, appearing, disappearing, appearing. What is vibrating is consciousness. What is vibrating is you as the universe. Okay, so when we say you are the universe, this is not a metaphor, it's literal. Without you, there is no universe. Without you, there's no experience of this body. Without you, there's no experience of a thought. Without you, there's no experience of an emotion. Without you, there's no experience of a perception. Without you, there is no experience of anything. But what you are is a particular species of an infinite consciousness. Just like uh, a mosquito is another species of consciousness. And the mosquito's universe, God knows what that is. What is the universe of an insect with a hundred eyes? Who knows? Okay. So infinite consciousness, formless, eternal, timeless, and we are like little branches of that. You know, Rumi has a great poem. Rumi has great poems. He's, you know, he says, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. Look at these worlds spinning out of nothingness. This is you. Beyond ideas of right and wrong, there's a field. I'll meet you there. But then one of his best, we are not just a drop in the ocean of consciousness. We are also the ocean in the drop. So you're both an individual, but also you're the infinite being. You're the infinite being having an individual experience. To what purpose? To find out who you are. Who am I? The infinite being having a local experience. 
who am I? A spiritual being having a human experience. What do I want? To find out who I am. What's my purpose? Discovery. What am I grateful for? Existence. You didn't ask to, be, to exist, but here you are. Okay, having this human experience. So, here's our formula to replace Einstein. U is equal to C. Universe is equal to consciousness. In fact, there's nothing other than consciousness. Consciousness is how we know any experience. The universe we know is a human construct. Human constructs come through what we call education. All education is ignorance. All education is ignorance of reality because education doesn't tell you how we know what we know. It's information. Why would I send a kid to an expensive school to get this? <laughs> this is on Google. <laughs> you want to know what the meaning of existence is, right? All experiences are modifications of core consciousness of pure awareness. Awareness is a field of infinite possibilities. It's who we are. Humans create constructs around raw experience and assign names to them. Constructs created science, technology, art, religion, and civilization. Are they useful? Yes. If I say to you, I'm going to meet you on Tuesday at 12 noon at the corner of Broadway and uh, 56th, and then we'll go to Serafina and have Caesar salad. That's a useful construct. If I didn't give, those, give you that information, we would probably never meet at the corner of 56th and Broadway. We would never end up in Serafina having Caesar salad. But these are names we have given to experience. Who decides this is Broadway? Who decides this is the line between Canada and the U.S.? Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's about time to build a wall and have the Americans, and have the Americans pay for it. <laughs> so <laughs> these are constructs. All walls are constructs. And the biggest constructs are mental constructs. Money is a construct. Wall Street is a construct. Nation states are constructs. Race is a construct. Religion is a construct. Reality is not a construct. Reality is that which gives rise to the construct. And that is consciousness. Now, this is very useful, right? It makes the human experience very navigable, we fly jet planes and we send rovers to Mars, and, but even the body is a construct. We're sending a construct to another construct. The only reality is consciousness in which those constructs are conceived, are governed, and come into existence. And the most difficult and fundamental constructs that we cannot get rid of because we are so bamboozled a mind, brain, body, world, and cosmos. These are names we give to experiences. Tell a dog it has a mind. Tell a dog it's called a dog. Tell Obama's dog that it was in the White House, sitting in the Oval Office, that his boss was a president. Poor Bo, he has no idea. We made it up. 
When we experience sensations, including sense perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts, acronym SIFT, we give it the name MIND. When we experience sense perceptions, we give them names such as brain, body, world, cosmos. Names and descriptions are language constructs that nail down raw experience. A baby's raw experience is sensory, sound, sight, touch, taste, and smell, along with pleasure and pain. The attraction or aversion to experience is rudimentary emotions. The interpretation of sense perception is thought. Without these human constructs, reality is consciousness in various modes of itself not yet labeled as sense perceptions, thoughts, emotions. The real reality is being, existence, awareness, timeless, formless, dimensionless. By the way, now scientists agree that the real reality is dimensionless. Einstein was the first one who kind of, he was such a genius that he was think at least, even though he was stuck with the materialist model because that's the prevailing model. He, he said, if all the objects in the universe disappeared, most people think that all that would be left is space. This is what Einstein said. If all it's in, in the book, if all the objects disappeared, all that would be left is space. He says most people think like that, but my theory says that if all the objects disappeared, even space would disappear. Time would disappear. What we call space is unmanifest consciousness, and what we call matter is manifest consciousness. And the distance between them is space-time, all in ourself. Mind, brain, cosmos, a human construct derived from modes of knowing and experience in consciousness. Forms and phenomena rise and fall in an eternal now. Last night's dream, but this one too. Forms and phenomena rising and falling eternally. Now. Now is not in time. Now is the window to eternity. Timeless. Devoid of constructs, we are et eternal timeless awareness, recycling in space-time as the experience of form and phenomena. Anything that can be named or described from particles to galaxies, DNA to genome, mind to brain, world to cosmos, is a human construct. Constructs are derived from modes of knowing and experience in consciousness, modifications of our self. You are the universe. There is only consciousness. If you're religious, you can say there's only God. God being the mystery that gives rise to this experience eternally now. Okay, I'm going to skip the rest of these slides. There's a whole section uh, called Qualia Science in the book. But um, birth, death, body, mind, God, stars, galaxies. These are constructs for experience. Your freedom lies in the experience of identity beyond constructs and pure awareness prior to subject-object split. The subject-object split is artificial. For me right now, I'm the subject of experience, you're the object. But for you, you are the subject and I'm the object. So which one is it? Actually, it's all one. Okay. All human suffering is the result of attachment to a construct. Death happens to an experience, not the awareness in which the experience is born and dies in the timeless moment of now. So freedom is now in just being. Okay, we'll take the break now for about whatever time, a construct. 
and then we'll do the next set of sutras. Thank you very much. <laughs>